What is up everybody? Random Random Man here in front of some of my Blu-ray collection and bringing you this first part of the video after I have already recorded the rest of it and I'm here basically to say that I did film these two reviews separately which is why it is obvious that I am wearing different shirts in both of them and it's clear that I filmed them at different times but I combined them together for convenience sake of my own and here is the time skip for my second review in case you want to skip right to that one. I will also leave it in the video description. Also, uh, this will be my last review for the next couple of weeks as starting next week, I will be out of state on vacation in Colorado, which is the setting of one of these movies I'm reviewing. Hopefully I don't run into the grabber, but in any sense, I will be back before the 4th of July and my next planned review will be for Thor Love and Thunder. So that's basically it. And now on to our feature presentations. What is up, everybody? Random, random man here. I hope everyone out there is continuing to stay safe and be well during this unpredictable time. As firstly, I am here bringing you my review for Elvis. Now, the plot of this biographical musical drama chronicles the life and career of singer and actor Elvis Presley, played by Austin Butler, from his early days as a child to becoming a rock and roll star and movie star, as well as his complex relationship with his manager, Colonel Tom Parker, played by Tom Hanks. Going into this movie, I was really looking forward to seeing it. Now to give my quick connection and thoughts on the title icon himself, I would say that I am a casual fan of Elvis. As a kid, I have heard many of his most famous songs like Blue Suede Shoes, Hound Dog, Can't Help Falling in Love, which is my personal favorite of his, among many others. Some of which I heard for the first time in 2002's Lilo and Stitch, which just turned 20 years old earlier this week. And yeah, simply put, he is the king of rock and roll and helped reshape the cultural zeitgeist during his lifetime. So it came to my surprise that we haven't gotten a biopic about one of the most famous people who's ever lived up until now, at least not one of this scale. In the 45 years since Elvis's passing, we have gotten multiple cultural depictions of him, including a television movie starring Kurt Russell as him, directed by John Carpenter. But now here, we have a biopic about Elvis that has been helmed by Boz Lerman. He is this film's co-writer, producer, and director, and he is a hit and miss filmmaker for many. I've enjoyed some of his past work, like Romeo and Juliet from 1996, which is probably my personal favorite film of his, but a lot of people do consider him to be style over substance, or full of substance given his style, depending on who you talk to. But given the title subject and what he has done in the past, it looked like he was going to bring something that was truly worthy of the prowess that the king of rock and roll was known for. And luckily for me, I was able to head out and see this thing at the first public screening in theaters where it is only currently available. Starting out with the cast and their performances, we have Austin Butler in the title role of the king of rock and roll himself. Now, I've actually recognized Austin Butler over the years on stuff since I was a kid, whether it is on background extra roles within programming from Disney Channel or Nickelodeon, to even more recent high-profile gigs like him playing one of the Manson murderers in 2019's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And here, given his biggest role yet, taking on one of the most famous people ever, this was quite a daunting task. But... I gotta say that this is one of the standout performances I've seen in any movie this year thus far. Butler brings both the pelvis that Elvis had given the presence of the performer when he was alive and the voice that he had as well in terms of singing chops as he did a lot of his own singing with some of the tracks he performs as Elvis according to the credits and soundtrack listings which is impressive and also seeing him be so immersed into 
this role. It also applies with his dramatic chops as well, given the increasing dependence on drugs that the real life Elvis had and also his complicated relationships with other people, including his manager, Colonel Tom Parker, as played by Tom Hanks. And he gives an interesting performance in this movie, to say the least. It is not just the fact that he is caked in makeup and prosthetics and uses a different voice to make him unrecognizable in the role, but it's also for how it's a rarity for Hanks to play someone so sleazy and scuzzy as Parker is portrayed in this film. He's normally known for his very nice guy, fatherly type attitude. He's basically America's dad, but here he is shown to be someone who is such a backstabber and user of Elvis who was literally trying to steal half of his fortune or whatever he was making. He narrates the movie from the get-go and the movie is structured around his perspective or at least what we're supposed to interpret from his perspective in how he quote made Elvis and he certainly was a big part of Elvis's success and notoriety. Aside from Presley and Parker, there are a multitude of other well-known figures that are portrayed across this movie, like legendary blues musician B.B. King, played by Kelvin Harrison Jr., producer and director Steve Bender, played by Dacre Montgomery, and Elvis's wife Priscilla, played by Olivia de Jonge. And I think that they all do well in their roles here, big or small, but I think that it goes without saying for how much acclaim that he has been getting for this role, it is Butler who is one of the two big stars of this movie. I do say one of two stars here, as the other one I am referring to is Boz Lerman himself, as, again, he is the co-writer, producer, and director of this movie. And one can tell from the get-go, in the way it starts, that this is a production by him with how extravagant he makes everything. As I mentioned earlier as well, this movie is structured around the retrospective perspective of Colonel Tom Parker. We see the film told from his eyes as he is dying in 1997, going all the way back through Elvis's childhood and how he grew up during the Great Depression, how he was inspired by African-American musicians that were playing country, blues, and gospel music, and then all the way through adulthood when he would go into his early recordings and eventually becoming one of the biggest stars ever. I thought the details that were shown here, like the bits and bursts of Elvis's life through Parker's eyes were enough, more than enough, to get us going and speeding through a lot of this movie, especially within the first hour and a half or so, as that is when Lerman as a filmmaker really shows off how he fires on all cylinders in trying to make this grand scope of a production, which gets into some of the technical merits of this movie right off the bat. Two of his previous movies, Moulin Rouge and 2013's The Great Gatsby, both won Academy Awards for their costumes and production design. And I gotta say that I will be surprised if this movie is not nominated for those two awards, among other potential nominations like one for Best Actor for Butler. Say what you will about Lerman, but he really does know how to put on a show with his signature style, and in a lot of ways was the ideal person to bring Elvis's life story to life, given the glitz and glam about the figure and all the glitz and glam that Lerman likes to put in his films. And when we go through the various decades that Elvis was around for, from the 1950s through the 1970s, we see all of the various stuff that he wears, the stages that he performs on, the amount of crowds that are screaming and crying for him, and even how the movie integrates the music all throughout it. It is no surprise, like zero surprise, that the music in this film is so good, given that it's Elvis. A lot of his famous hits, like the ones I've mentioned earlier in this review, are there, as well as some modern music that are using elements from Elvis's songs for this movie soundtrack. For example, there is a track here called Vegas by Doja Cat, who I personally love, that interpolates Hound Dog throughout it, and it is used specifically for this one montage sequence that I thought worked given the context of it. There's also a cover of Can't Help Falling in Love by Casey Musgraves, who has a great voice. And then other music in here by various artists such as Eminem, CeeLo Green, and Tame Impala, just to name a few that I thought all worked into the overall style of this movie that Lerman is getting across too. And I mentioned a montage sequence just now too. And the way this movie is edited, 
it's edited together in such a fast way and in an erratic way in some senses to where, yeah, it's going really quickly to show how much of the fast lane that Elvis was living through. But I don't think it's something that goes to the detriment of itself like another biopic, Bohemian Rhapsody, to where that just felt like it was so discombobulated and chopped up at times. Here, I thought it worked for what was being portrayed given, again, the title subject. And I feel with how the pace goes throughout the movie, it mostly keeps itself up to an entertaining degree. I say mostly too, because this movie runs at just over two and a half hours, and that is a behemoth of a running time giving everything that is covered here. And it goes into the main issue I have with the film in that I think it is bloated. I think it is too long, and I was starting to feel the running time in the last hour or so of the movie. And that is when the film also does fall into some of the trappings that biopics usually get into, which is almost inevitable given the fall of this real-life icon. But that has become inevitable, I think, for a movie like this in trying to portray Elvis' life as much as it is done here. And I gotta say that it's a bit refreshing of sorts to see a film like this, a biopic that is this epic in scale, be made and released as more recently, I would say the better part of the last decade, we have gotten biographical films that cover a small portion of a subject's life and not really one that goes through the life and death of somebody. Like Spencer from last year just covers three days in the life of Princess Diana. Yes, there are aspects of Elvis's personal life that are glossed over or skimped over here for the sake of efficiency and running as a dramatization of his life. And I could see some complaining that there are not enough musical elements of Elvis done here. Though I think with the amount of time that is dedicated to him singing and dancing, I think that there's more than enough to really gawk into. This isn't a musical musical, not like one, let's say, compared to 2019's Rocket Man that was in the structure of a jukebox musical in covering the life of Elton John here. And I do personally prefer Rocket Man over Elvis, but comparing it to something like Bohemian Rhapsody, I think Elvis has a leg up on that one by quite a bit in both being more entertaining and I think there are being more attributes in the technical merit Fans of The King should be satisfied in how he is portrayed and tributed here. If you are not a fan of Elvis or are not acquainted with him, then one should embark in seeing this movie to get a taste of the impact that he has made across pop culture that is still being felt 45 years after his passing, as he is the best-selling solo artist of all time for no small reason. There are a multitude of reasons here as portrayed by this boisterous biopic that flamboyantly flies all throughout it. I definitely recommend Elvis. With that, my final verdict for Elvis is four out of five stars. Finally, here is my review for The Black Phone. Based on the 2004 short story of the same name by Joe Hill, the plot of this supernatural horror film basically follows an abducted teenager, played by Mason Thames, who uses a mysterious phone to communicate with the previous victims of his captor, played by Ethan Hawke. Going into this movie, I initially did not have much interest in seeing it. When I saw the trailers for this thing, I did not think that it looked like my cup of tea, and not just because it is a horror film. If you already know me by now, you know that that is a genre of film I usually do not gravitate towards. It looked like yet another kind of film that was set in a prior decade that was going through the usual motions with a masked killer. However, I did hear a lot of good buzz about this movie coming out of the festival circuit. It and Top Gun Maverick were screened in full at this year's CinemaCon, and this is also the latest directorial effort from Scott Derrickson, whose only film I had seen prior to this one was 2016's Doctor Strange, which means I have not seen any of his other horror movies before The Black Phone. I have not seen Sinister, nor Deliver Us From Evil, nor The Exorcism of Emily Rose. So I was going into this thing open-minded and watching it as a movie in general as well. And luckily for me, I was able to head out and see this thing in theaters where it is only currently available. 
Starting out with the cast and their performances, we have Mason Thames as Finney, the latest victim of the grabber abducted while he's on his way home from school. Now, I'm mentioning his performance first because a lot of this movie's believability hinges on our believability as to how this character would get out of this situation alive. And I think that Thames is terrific in this movie. He is someone who, in general, while he's a student at school, is not one who is very tough. He doesn't stand up for himself but he also always has his sister by his side. But then of course, he is then abducted and away from everyone except for the grabber. And he is somebody who is initially scared as any kid would be in this really messed up situation. But he is resourceful, not just with the title black phone, but also with the environment around him to try and find a way out. In speaking of Finney's sister as well, we have Gwen, played by Madeline McGraw, and she is someone who is feisty, also funny, and really doesn't take any crap from anybody. She is also religious, or so it seems to be that way, because she has been experiencing psychic dreams that are somehow connected to a bunch of the recent abductions, and now with her brother having been abducted, she tries to hone this power to try to find any way to discover where he is being being held. And like Thames, I think McGraw also gives a formidable performance in this movie. Both of them here, I think, were super well cast in their roles. Then we have Ethan Hawke as the grabber himself. Earlier this year, he showed up in The Northman and also had a villainous turn in the Disney Plus MCU series Moon Knight. And now with the grabber, I think he has now etched himself a bit of a niche in creating a new horror icon of sorts. I mean, it's too soon to tell how impactful he'll be later on in the future of the genre, but just with the design of the mask that he wears here, it's very Lon Chaney-esque, and with his overall demeanor in being unsettling, yeah, this is someone who is very unhinged as well. And the fact that he does have this mask on and changes it up throughout the movie is something that adds into the mystique of this character. Also being in the guise of a magician and it's creepy the way he leaves a bunch of black balloons tied together as his calling card after having abducted a child. And yeah, I think Hawk haunts this movie across it. And then there are a couple of other uh, worthy players I want to mention in this movie, like James Ransone, who has a brief but memorable turn as this guy, who I don't want to spoil entirely, but all I'll say is that he is someone who has been investigating these kidnappings himself, and it's just a coked up person. And finally, there's Jeremy Davies as the abusive alcoholic father to Finney and Gwen, who is someone who could easily be cast out as a stereotypical kind of character here. But I think with what screen time he does have gives us a bit to work with in that he is somebody who just can't quit the bottle and is also trying to look out for the safety of his kids. But in any sense, he contributes to this cast here being strong overall, especially the performances of our two to young main players and Hawk. The screenplay of this film was done by director Derrickson and C. Robert Cargill, who also produced the movie with Derrickson. And it's interesting to note that the short story that this movie is based on was written by Joe Hill, who is the son of Stephen King. Of course, everyone knows who Stephen King is, whether you know his books or his various media that they have been turned into. But getting back to the Black Phone, the way this movie is set up and where it takes place, it is set in uh, North Denver in 1978. And right away, the world building of this movie is effective to show how dull and dreary the whole thing looks, especially with how bleak it is in a child abductor being rampant across this quiet neighborhood. We see a bit of the home lives of Finney and Gwen and also how they are at school with both of them getting beat up. And when kids get beat up in this movie, they are beaten to a pulp. I did not expect it to be that brutal on top of the idea of the grabber going around grabbing kids. It actually takes a bit for Finney to eventually get abducted. And we are given setup here and there like the psychic dreams that Gwen has been having. 
setting and the overall supernatural elements that this movie carries. And that was something I was initially skeptical with how they were going to be handled in this movie, as they're really not explained too much aside from the little bits of information we're given in how Gwen is someone that the police take an interest to with these dreams being connected to the grabber's victims. And I will say that in getting the plot started and eventually seeping through to where we see Finney get abducted and him trying to get out of being abducted, I think that it really increases the seething nature of this movie. I would describe this movie as more of a supernatural thriller than a straight up supernatural horror film. Yeah, there are jump scares here and there, but I think the tension that this movie has is brought on by how there's some unpredictability in here as to how Finney's going to get out of this and also his sister helping with their connection afar. And that is due to the direction by Scott Derrickson and having an assured hand in getting it all focused together in the way the movie flows all around. And I think that it does create for effective moments that I was uh, holding my arms or gritting my teeth in viewing and also basking in a lot of the technical merits that this movie has. Has. I've already mentioned that this movie does have a really grim look to it. It's very gray. There's also the added effect of it looking like it was shot on film or really grainy film from 1978 to back up the overall feel of it. And even the sound design, I gotta give a shout out to with how this movie plays around with it a lot. Like there's this one moment where Finney is looking around the basement he is trapped in and eventually there's a scare moment in here, but I thought it was brought on with the visuals and sound being combined together that I thought, whoo, that was effective to try to get into some psychological elements as well. This movie is a bit on the psychological side too, which I do enjoy. In speaking of the way this movie sounds too, the original score of this film was composed by Mark Corvin. And I gotta say, it's one of the standout scores I've heard in any movie this year thus far, as what plays over the opening title credits really huh, got me a bit creeped out and how it permeates throughout the rest of the movie with the instrumentation mixing it up with some electronic beats and also some traditional instruments. I thought that was a good mix together that kept me going and heightened while watching it. And the way it runs all together, this movie runs at about an hour and 40 minutes, which is about an hour less than the previous movie I have just reviewed. And here I think the pace really does not waste that much time in going for delivering a bunch of scares, also getting us moments of the plot being unfolded right in front of us. Though I will say there isn't that much delved into that is deeper than some of the basic beats that we were given from the get-go. Like I've already mentioned how the supernatural element of this movie is there basically and is not that much uh, expanded upon from what we are initially given. Also the motivations of the grabber himself. He's basically just a standard, though I would say more than standard in the sense of his presence, kind of villain where we don't know exactly why he's doing this. There's just crazy people out there like there is in real life, I suppose. But all in all, I gotta say that I was a bit surprised with how taken I was by the black phone as when it reaches its third act, it builds to being an overall satisfying 70s supernatural thriller that I think horror fans will be themselves satisfied by in viewing. And even if you're not that much into horror like I am, I would say give this movie a shot because there's stuff in here like the performances and the overall building of tension that got me appreciating what it was doing quite a bit. Right now in theaters, especially with these two newest wide releases that I have reviewed, there is something playing for just about anyone looking for something to watch in a theater. And we're only going to get further into the summer movie season as it does progress. I definitely recommend The Black Phone. With that, my final verdict for The Black Phone is 4 out of 5 stars. Thank you all, as always, for watching. Be sure to like this video, comment on what you thought of Elvis and the Black Phone, social media links in the description, subscribe to my channel for more, and I'll catch you on the next movie review.